Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 25th of March. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 28th of March, with me, Michael Hewson. Um, given the fact that I will also be away for next week, I'll also be doing a quick preview of the week beginning the 4th of April as well. So essentially, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Um, that being said, obviously, it'll be fairly light in terms of what to expect for the week beginning of the 4th of April, simply because of the fact that I won't have visibility of events over the course of the um, next week or so. But hopefully nothing much on a macro level should significantly change. Geopolitical risks will still be pretty much the same. Obviously, um, the Russia invasion of Ukraine, um, the fact that they continue to get bogged down there, and I think the biggest risk factor going forward is likely to be um, an escalation on the part of President Putin, the use of um, the use of weapons of mass destruction, whether they be chemical weapons um, or um, tactical nukes, if he continues to be frustrated in his aims to try and make inroads into Ukrainian territory. As we look ahead, to the coming week, the, the the main the main data of note is going to be U.S. inflation data, core PCE PCE deflator, non-farm payrolls on the first of April. Um, sadly, there will not be a webinar next week in my absence, as I will be away from my desk, out of the office. But payrolls data generally doesn't tend to be the market mover that it used to be. But I would still urge you to keep an eye out for wages data um, in the context of the wider payrolls number, given the fact that the Fed, the Federal Reserve essentially has um, indicated that it's likely to go harder and faster when it comes to rate rises when it next meets. Um, obviously, the week beginning the 4th of April, we've also got the latest Fed minutes. They are likely to be fairly dated by then, given the narrative that we've heard from a number of Fed policymakers, even the more dovish ones like Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed and Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed, they have suggested that they are probably more disposed to going for 50 basis points in May if the data supports that. But more importantly, um, Powell's comments this week would appear to suggest that he is minded to go not only for a 50 basis point rate move in May, but potentially um, further 50 basis point rate moves going forward. And I think that really does highlight the conundrum that is driving the central bank's reaction function when it comes to what's likely to come in terms of rate hikes over the course of the rest of this year. Inflation is already heading to levels last seen in the 1980s and 1990s, not only in the US, but in the UK as well. This week we saw UK inflation at its highest levels since 1990, again, this time at 6.2%. Um, in the coming week, US core PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, is likely to also push through 6%, while core PCE is expected to rise to around about 5.5. So 5.5, 6.4, on the PCE deflator, we've got fourth quarter GDP, the final number there. That is expected to be revised up to 7.1%. And US consumer confidence has been on a downward track for several months now and is likely to continue to fall further in March when those numbers are released on the 29th. Um, so I think with respect to non-farm payrolls, the employment, the US labor market still remains in fairly decent health. We're expected to see 450,000 jobs added in March. We're also expected to see a fairly strong ADP payrolls number that is continuing to push the dollar index up to um, the recent highs that we saw in March. More importantly, if we look at US yields, we can see that here on this Bloomberg chart. We're now back at 2.4%. If we go back on a five-year basis, um, we're still well below the levels that we saw back in 2019. And we also need to remember that the Fed funds rate 
which is now at 0.25 to 0.5 percent is still well below the levels it was pre-pandemic fed funds was 1.5 to 1.75 so we've certainly got an, at least another 100 basis points in rate hikes to catch up from where we were pre-pandemic on the us on a us basis whereas with the bank of england we're already back at the levels that we were pre-pandemic and as for the ecb well we haven't really moved that much so if we look at um headline rates in terms of the us um on us rates we're still one percent below the levels that we were um two years ago so you know we can still move another 100 basis points um before we start to get really concerned about a significant tightening of monetary policy even though obviously if we look at what yields are telling us there's a significant disconnect from the fed funds um relative to where the bond market is pricing so it's going to be interest it's going to be it's certainly going to be an interesting next couple of weeks looking ahead to the week beginning the the 4th of april we've got the rba and you can you can certainly argue that the rba is well behind the curve when it comes to rate expectations and rate rises and if we look at the aussie dollar what we've seen here is a significant break higher. What we haven't done as yet is broken below or broken above the peaks that we saw back in October last year at 75.70. But I think that's because the RBA has been uncharacteristically dovish in recent months, despite rising evidence that inflation is running well ahead of expectations. And if you look at what the RBNZ has done, they've already started their rate hiking cycle. And uh, the RBA hasn't. So RBA has got significant a way to catch up when it comes to hawkish expectations. Certainly events have moved on um, in the past couple of months, which suggests that the RBA could be closer to moving rates off their current 0.1% than at any time in the last six months. Ex expectations are for a rate hike in June. Personally, I think we could get a move in April. I think the RBA needs to start getting out in front of inflation uh, and the rise in inflation that we're seeing in, in terms of the Australian economy. Now, it still seems some way off if you believe the narrative that's coming out from Governor Lowe. He's certainly gone to great lengths to play down the prospect of a rate rise this year. But like the ECB, um, I think the RBA will have to act. Um, in the same way that the Bank of England, who played down the prospect of was slightly more dovish than the Fed was, central banks will have to act on inflation, whether they like it or not, because if they don't, inflation will do their job. You know, well, basically, inflation will tip economies into recession. So they have a choice. Hike rates and prompt a recession or allow inflation to let rip. And get an inflation and get, in, get a recession anyway more importantly um, get more persistent inflation going forward it's you know it's a dilemma to be quite honest but to be quite honest i think it's the lesser of two evils rates need to be normalized or at least brought back to a level that's commensurate with the levels of inflation that we're seeing let's not forget the last time we saw these levels of inflation in the us and the uk interest rates were above the level of headline inflation not anchored well below so there needs to be some level of normalization that obviously won't cause a significant amount of disruption and won't offset the damage that higher inflation is likely to cause you know in that context on the 1st of april uh, next friday we've also got the latest flash cpi numbers from the eu now we're already at record levels when it comes to cpi in the euro area we're at 5.8 percent in march that's likely to move to 6.3 percent with core prices set to move from 2.7 percent to 3.1 percent so what does that mean for euro dollar well essentially nothing much has changed when it comes to euro dollar um, we're still very much below this 111.20 area we've really struggled to get much above it it's been a little bit of Zedsville this week in terms of what Euro dollar has done. But 
let me remind you of the long-term trend line that I showed you in last week's video. We're still um, holding above that key support from those lows back in 2017. Uh, and that for me remains the, the line in the sand. A move below 107.80 is likely to see euro dollar move quite a bit lower. Essentially, if the Fed tightens as fast or as hard as I expect it to, you know, we're talking about another six rate rises this year. Well, what, what's not said is how big those rate rises will be. You've had Bullard saying he wants a Fed funds rate of 3% by the end of this year. Well, we're currently at 0.5. Um, if we take it back to 20, um, 2020 levels or pre-pandemic, that's 1.5 to 1.75. So that's only halfway back. So the big question is how much can the Fed get away with and what does that mean for the dollar? In terms of what the dollar's done against the euro this week, it's not done an awful lot. But if we look at dollar yen, um, it's gone absolutely gangbusters this week. And the yen is likely, has already hit its lowest levels since 2015. It's likely to post its biggest monthly loss since September 2016. Um, and as such, has prompted some concerns or some chatter that the Bank of Japan might intervene to cap the decline in the yen. Certainly, the decline of the yen in itself isn't really that much of a problem for the Bank of Japan. It's more a case of how quickly it's happening. So I think we could see um, the Bank of Japan try and start to jawbone and slow the decline in the yen. But I certainly think there's potential for us to revisit the highs of 2015 back around about 125 and these sorts of levels all the way back here. So you're talking 125.85. I mean, that gives you a context, some sort of context when it comes to the actual levels of decline uh, and the advance of the dollar. Essentially, what that's showing you is the fact that monetary policy in Japan is not going anywhere and you're getting a significant um, move higher in terms of the dollar against the yen. So there's certainly potential for a move back to the highs that we saw back in 2015 when it comes to dollar yen. As for cable, um, we're sort of struggling to find any sort of support around about um, this 50 day moving average. We're struggling to rally much above 132.20 uh, and, and that is a little bit of a concern going forward. This was potentially an inverse head and shoulders here, left shoulder here, head here, right shoulder here, but unfortunately we've broken back below it. And that's disappointing because that does appear to suggest that we could well see further declines in the value of the pound. And we're not helped by the fact that the, the budget this week from Rishi Sunak, um, the UK Chancellor, didn't really go anywhere near to addressing uh, the tax rises that are coming in April, but also the 54% rise in energy prices, as well as other tax rises that are likely to come in in April as well, namely council tax, um, council tax as well, and the fact that he was very reluctant to um, extend um, the the VAT tax relief that um, um, he gave to businesses as a, businesses as a consequence of the pandemic. So it's going to be very, very difficult next few months for the UK economy. And if you've then got a Bank of England that's likely to raise rates over the raise rates again over the course of the next few months, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't make for a particularly encouraging outlook. And to a large extent, it's self-inflicted um, in terms of government fiscal policy as well. So it's not a particularly positive outlook. We've got a cost of living squeeze coming. Some of them, he, you know, the Chancellor has taken some measures to ameliorate some of them, but I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as significant as it could be. So obviously, though, those are the key levels on um, cable and and the euro dollar. Euro sterling is much of a muchness, still very much a case of watching paint dry here, but still very significant resistance anywhere above 84 fairly decent support around about 82, 80, um, 83. So very much a continuation of the range trade that we've been seeing over the course of the past few weeks. So what what's the outlook for indices? Well, we've certainly seen 
a fairly decent rebound in the FTSE this week, but it's really been a case of consolidating the gains that we've seen over the course of the past two weeks. We've pretty much traded sideways. What's significant, I think, in the context of the rebound that we've been seeing is we haven't taken out previous peaks. So while there's been an awful lot of chatter over the course of the past few days that we might have seen the lows, I've seen nothing thus far to suggest that we can continue to move higher quite significantly. If we look at this peak back here in February 20, February last month, just post invasion, um, we're still below, we're still above, still below, sorry, 75.60 and, and below the previous peaks. The FTSE 100 has bounced back certainly much more than, say, for example, the DAX, but that's largely as a result of a significant rebound in the likes of banks, but also miners and the likes of BP and Royal Dutch Shell. If we look at the Germany 40 or the DAX, and we look at the, if we look at this daily chart here, we're still in the downtrend that we've been in since early January. So while we've seen a fairly decent rebound in the past few days, we look as if we could well finish slightly lower this week. Um, we're struggling to move much above the peaks of 14,580 that we saw um, last week, but also this week as well. And we're also below the 200 day and the 50 day moving average. So we've seen a fairly decent rebound just of, of just over 50%. But what we haven't seen um, is a break of this downtrend line that we've been in since those peaks back in January. If we look at the S&P 500, we have seen a much stronger rebound as borne out by this chart here. And we have broken the downtrend line, but that downtrend line was much steeper. So if we take that out, what's significant is we're still below these peaks here. So we're still getting lower highs and we're still getting lower lows. So I would only be a slightly more confident of a rebound uh, and a continued gains in US markets if we take out this series of peaks back in February last month. So around about 4,600 on the S&P. Yes, we are back above the 200 day moving average. We are back above the 50 day moving average, but we're not really impulsive, impulsively moving above it. And that is a little bit of a worry in the short to medium term. So certainly, you know, I'm not gonna say with any degree of certainty that the lows are in because we haven't taken out the previous peaks. Same applies to the NASDAQ. We are below the 200 day moving average still. So that again is significant. Even though we've broken above the 200 day moving average on the S&P 500, we've not been confirmed with that when it comes to the NASDAQ. And when it comes to calling a reversal on equity markets, what I wanna see is convergence in terms of we want to see a significant breakout on other indices as well and we're not seeing that and we're also below the peaks that we saw in february of around about 15,240. so yes we've seen some decent gains but the big question is can we consolidate those gains and we can we push above the february highs let's have a quick look at the the dac the 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 dow not the dax the dow put my teeth in. Again, we're below the 200 day moving average on the Dow as well. And significantly, we're also below the February peaks. So it's always important that when you look at US markets, you look at them in the round. You don't just look at the, you don't just look at the S&P, you don't just look at the, the Dow and you don't just look at the NASDAQ in isolation. They come as a package, you know, and as a package, they really need to show evidence that that base is in place and we're now looking to move towards the upside. You see with this trend line here, we have broken above it, but again, the, the move higher has been tepid at best. So certainly worth, um, there, there are certain flashing warning signs about being overly bullish um, when it comes to equity markets against a backdrop of yields that at the moment show little signs of topping out. Now, if we go back, to the chart of the US 10 year, you can see here how, mile, how far we've come in the space of the last three weeks. We've come from lows of around about uh, one, 
1.66% to 2.4% on a weekly chart. If we make that a daily chart, we can see there's potential for a little bit, a little bit of a reversal here. Is that a bearish reversal there on that daily candle on the 23rd? We won't know um, for certain. What we do need to be, what we do need to see is for it to stay below 2.4%, these, these highs here. And we could as such see a little bit of a correction lower. But at the moment, the line of least resistance does appear to be a further higher rates. And if US data continues to come in on the upside, then that is likely to give an indication that perhaps there is potential for further upside in US 10 year yields, US two yields and US five year yields. So just a quick recap for next week, non-farm payrolls looking for around about um, 450,000 on the headline, 400,000 on ADP. The unemployment, the unemployment rate is expected to fall back further to 3.7%. Weekly jobless claims are at 53 year lows. Look at the participation rate, look for a continued gain there. Look for wage growth to improve from the current from the current levels of around about 5.5%. So you want to see wage growth head towards 6% so that the income squeeze gets mitigated to some extent. Um, so as I say, non-farm payrolls for next week, core PCE, PCE deflator on the 30th, and we also have one item in terms of also also flash CPI, EU flash CPI on the Friday as well. In terms of earnings numbers, keep an eye on Walgreens Boots Alliance. There has been some chatter that um, Walgreens is looking to sell its boots operation, UK operation, with Apollo Global Management said to be interested in buying that for £7 billion. So that could be a significant driver of the share price, Walgreens Boots Alliance. Um, certainly they have been one of the winners. Oh, not so much one of the winners, but they've certainly done well from the pandemic in the US. You can certainly see that in the context of the share price rises that we've seen. But their boots operation has been a little bit of an anchor around its neck. So if they're able to offload that, that could be a catalyst for a little bit of a bump higher in the share price. As we look ahead, to the 4th of April. Um, that week there, we've got the RBA meeting on the 5th. As I say, I've covered that. Look for potentially hawkish um, pivot there with the potential for a modest rate hike. We'll have to wait and see. We've got Fed minutes um, coming out that week. We've also got ECB minutes. And I think the ECB minutes could be interesting in the context of Joachim Nagel's, the Bundesbank governor's um, comments that he's talking about the need for tighter policy. We certainly know there are divisions on the ECB governing council. Recent comments from a number of policymakers suggest there's rising concern that the ECB is behind the curve and the, the minutes for this week could well offer significant insights as how high this concern actually is. In terms of earnings numbers, we've got ASOS um, first half numbers on the 8th of April. Um, you've got to ask yourself at some point, whether or not we're going to get a rebound in the ASOS share price. We're expecting a fairly decent set of numbers, but on the 2nd of March, the company issued another profits warning because it suspended sales in Ukraine as it became impossible to serve customers there, and it also suspended sales in Russia. These two regions represent 4% of revenue for ASOS and 20%, 20 million pounds of group profit. So you have to sort of question whether or not that is a lot of that is already priced in and the profits warning was around about there. You saw the share price dip down. It has rebounded a little bit, but it's continued to drag or drift lower. The big level on that is really the April 2020 lows. And we saw a rebound and now we've given back pretty much all of that post pandemic bounce. And we're now pretty much back to where we were when we started. So ASOS first half numbers, they should be interesting for the week beginning the 4th of April. We've also got services PMIs as well. We pretty much know that there's at some point we're going to get a little bit of squeeze on services, particularly given the fact that um, PPI in Italy is at 41%. In, in, in Germany, it's 25%. You've got to think that some of those cost pressures will start to manifest itself in headline inflation as we head 
into the second quarter of this year. Um, quickly have a quick have a quick look at Brent crude commodity prices. Let's look at that. Um, seeing a little bit of choppiness at the moment. The, the rebound that we've seen this week hasn't been able to get back above 125. So that could be significant in the wider scheme of things. If we look at a weekly chart, um, that gives us a better indication. The big support level um, is back around about $98 a barrel. Um, maybe, just maybe, we've got a short-term peak in. I'm not convinced about that at the moment, but it is encouraging that we haven't taken out these highs here, which suggests that some of the upward momentum might be might be waning. But I think a lot of the reason why we haven't followed through on the upside is because EU leaders cannot agree a ban on Russian oil imports. So those will keep flowing. Gold, it's been quite interesting over the course of the past few days. We've seen a fairly decent rebound. It's at the beginnings of a potential head and shoulders reversal. We certainly haven't taken out um, this 1965 area here. That's going to be key in terms of a potential rebound back to the highs that we saw earlier in March. Fairly decent trend line support on this blue line through here. So certainly keep an eye on that going forward. Um, so I think, ladies and gentlemen, that is pretty much it for um, this two weeks. As I say, I've tried to cover as much ground as I can over the course of the next two weeks, because obviously there won't be a video next Friday. So I've tried to cover as much ground as I can over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. Don't forget that the clocks go forward this weekend. So it's we once again go back to a five hour time difference between um, US trading and European trading. Otherwise, until two weeks from today, um, have a great week trading and I'll speak to you all same time, same place in a couple of weeks time. Thank you for listening.